Well, let's make sure we know how to do the Gabriel synthesis. That's an important topic. So let's do this synthesis problem. Let's start with this starting material. And show how to actually make an actual amino acid. Let's see how we can start with this starting material and actually make this into synthesis the Synthesis or just me uh, mechanism or just the synthesis? Uh, well, we'll do the synthesis. It might help you to show the mechanism for some of the steps. But, but actually, let's just focus on what reagents we need to add. So we'll have to start by asking well, what's the first reagent, second reagents, and uh, maybe we'll draw some of the intermediates as we go along. Both of you suggested starting with the base. That's good. And we want to use a base that matches our L groups here so we avoid competition. So that would put, that would deprep make this alpha carbon with a negative charge on it. We know it's very easy to make this into an enolate because it's doubly stabilized by resonance. Of course, we need to know what the side chain for methionine looks like. We can look that up in our table. Like this. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing that's helpful to keep in mind here is in this compound here, this is going to become the alpha carbon. And now we need to add this side chain over here. So we need to add who's going to be the beta carbon over here. So we can call this number one and number two. Uh, so you added Now the important thing is we have to put something on this number one carbon that's going to make the nucleophile attack it. So both of you came up with a leading group to put here. So that's good. And then what type of reaction will we have between here and here? Just an SN2 reaction. So we'll have an SN2 that's going to put this side chain onto this alpha carbon. Is that why the only reason you can, you can only use Gabriel when it's primary right. chain? Right. It might work for a secondary, but it wouldn't work for a tertiary. Okay. Yeah. Because uh, it's going to be a primary system. That's right. All right, at the same time, I won't redraw the whole thing. I'll just say that after the SN2, we'll have put this new side chain on. All right, and what's the next step? H3O plus and heat. And that does a lot of things. What, what, what does that do first? Uh, turn the OH into OH2. It hydrolyzes the esters into carboxylic acids, and they'll be in their protonated form because we're under acidic conditions. Hydrolyze It's also going to hydrolyze these uh, imide bonds. That's right. So we're going to break these imide bonds. And I would expect the amine here to be in its positive form. And is this a good candidate for decarboxylation? Yes, because it's a beta carbonyl carboxy group. So then we're going to lose one of the carboxy groups. And what do you know? That's methionine. This is methionine right here. Very good. Now, um, it would seem to me like this would produce methionine with a protonated carboxy group and a protonated amine group. Uh, for some reason, they don't seem to write it that way in the book, though. In the book, they wrote it with a protonated amine and a deprotonated carboxylate. They do that a lot. <coughs> Write the amino acids with a protonated amino group and a deprotonated carboxylate. That doesn't seem consistent with these conditions to me, so I don't know why they're, how they're coming up with that. But I did notice that the book wrote it this way, but uh, it doesn't seem right to me, so I'm going to write it 
this way instead. Okay, very good. So uh, that synthesis didn't give you uh, any trouble. So. How about let's see how to synthesize glutamic acid. So again, we'll start with the same starting material, but now we want to synthesize glutamic acid. That's an interesting question. It's a good thing that you're thinking about that. Make sure you get the right number of carbons in the side chain. Glutamic acid has a three carbon side chain. Here again is the alpha carbon, and you need to connect this number one carbon over here. We need to call this the number one. So we can start with the base. Put a negative charge here on our alpha carbon. And now we need to come up with this side chain. Well, the first thing we might think is that we could just do this. It might seem like we can just do this to add the number one carbon to the alpha carbon. But as I think we saw, there is a problem here. Um, it's difficult to work with carboxylic acids because instead of attacking the number one, the xenolate could just deprotonate the carboxy, uh, the, the carboxylic acid over here. So that's right. In a sense, we have to protect this functional group over here. Uh, if the enolate is not going to give us a good yield attacking the number one here, because in many cases it will just deprotonate uh, this car carboxylic acid. Carboxylic acids, the lesson here is carboxylic acids can be difficult to work with. So oftentimes we shouldn't work with them. Now, I think that um, one of you thought that we could protect this with an acetal, um, that, uh, but that would work for an aldehyde or a ketone. We can't make an acetal out of a carboxylic acid. Can we just make it into CH3 and then add any two? CR207 at the end? Uh, to, to oxidize it. Now remember that you can't normally oxidize alkanes oh, all the way to carboxylic acids. That's only for benzylic carbons. The simplest thing is just to start with an ester group instead of a carboxy group. Because it's very easy to turn esters into carboxy groups. Now in a sense we're not really protecting. It's not like you have to start with the carboxylic acid and make it into an ester. Let's just start with the ester. We can add any reagents we want. So we'll just add this ester here and and we'll see how this works. So now we can do a normal SN2, where this nucleophile attacks the number one. Because when we add H3O plus the heat and red stuff, it'll turn into a carboxy anyway. Very good point. Exactly. Incidentally, it seems like uh, apparently enolates don't do nucleophilic attack on carboxylic acid derivatives. The textbook never seems to worry about that. So we won't worry about this enolate attacking this carbonyl here and doing an addition elimination reaction. That doesn't seem to happen. Enolates, we have seen that enolates can do SN2 reactions, but I haven't seen any examples of enolates attacking carboxylic acid derivative carbons. We won't worry about that. So we're simply going to do our normal SN2 reaction over here and attach this. Then we'd be in good shape. Now before we go on, let me show you how the book did this. The book didn't actually put an alpha halide here, although I think that would work fine. They used an alternative approach. They put a double bond here. And then they did this. That is, they treated this like as an electrophilic carbon. Now, why are they right? Why would this carbon be electrophilic in this case? This is the beta carbon to the carbonyl. Why would the beta carbon be electrophilic? Alpha 
the beta unsaturated. Carbonyl. And why is the beta carbon there electrophilic? Because through resonance it can get right. plus charge on There's a resonance structure where there's a full positive charge on this beta carbon. I think we've mainly only talked about that for aldehydes and ketones, but that's true for any alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl. In any alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl, the beta carbon is electrophilic because of this resonance structure. So they did this attack. This is what we call a Michael attack, right? When we uh, attacked a beta carbon in an alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl with an enolate, that's called a Michael addition. So they did a Michael addition. Um, and uh, so uh, I, um, I think it would be perfectly fine to do it the alkyl halide way either, but you should be familiar with both approaches here. Here, because there's a carbonyl in this position, there's another way to make this electrophilic. But I, I think just putting, doing an SN2 on an alkyl halide here would have worked fine as well. 